I'm with Dwayne Dunham. First of all, thank you very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. So I wanted to start off by asking uh, your background. How did you get into the industry? I mean, you're a longtime veteran of the film and TV industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did it all start for you? I grew up in Southern California. There was a neighbor, a guy who lived across the street who worked for NASA and the aerospace industry, and he was a film buff. And he got me interested in cameras, and I used to make little surf movies and ski films with my buddies. And then I went to film school in San Francisco, San Francisco State, and I got very, very lucky. At, at that time when I graduated, the Bay Area was really cooking with a lot of interesting projects. The first project I worked on was a apprentice editor on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in Berkeley. Well, and so was it difficult when you first started? Like, I'm assuming you just graduated school and then now you're in the industry or, you know, so-called you have to make it somehow, right? Well, it's, what was, it's, the, what it's was only, it like? It's, it's about as difficult as a dream is because it was a dream. I was in, even though I was in film school making little films and I had participated in, in even making, you know, professional ski movies and that sort of thing, the idea of working in theatrical film professionally was a different world altogether. Guys like George, I admired. I did my thesis on THX 1138. I was very impressed by that movie. And, you know, just the idea of meeting somebody like George or Francis or, you know, any of those guys, Milos Forman on Cuckoo's Nest, I would see articles about the different projects in the Bay Area and just think, you know, I'm a student and, you know, that's a whole other world that I can only dream of being part of. And then, you know, for me, like I said, it was very, very lucky because I had just graduated from school and I was on my way to Los Angeles to go work for Warren Miller doing some ski films and surf movies. <laughs> and I got a call from a previous instructor who was my senior instructor at San Francisco State. And he was post-production supervisor on Cuckoo's Nest. And he just asked if I wanted a job. And for me, it was like, I'll be right there. And I was. And, and that really started it. As I said, I got very lucky that just one day I was visiting in Southern California staying with my grandparents for the weekend and I was at the beach and when I got home my grandmother said I've been, there's been seven or eight phone calls somebody you know trying to reach you and I asked for the number and it was a Bay Area number and I thought I don't want to call anybody because it has something to do with work and you know I just like to be at the beach for the next day or two so finally I did call back and I couldn't believe when this woman turned out to be Jane Bay uh, George's longtime assistant, right? Yeah. She had just been hired, and so she said, just a minute, George Lucas wants to talk to you. And, of course, I was, get out of here. Who is this? You know, who put you up to this? This is this can't be. You know, who is this? She, and, you know, she got a little, a little frustrated and just, just hang on, will you? And then this guy comes on the phone and says, hello. And said, hello, and I want you to come work for me. And, you know, I said, well... Maybe you ought to meet me first. He said, okay, when can you be here? I said, well, <laughs> you know, I'll drive up on Monday. <laughs> and so that's how it happened. It was really that lucky, just really that, that no lucky. Kidding. So can I ask how they heard of you? Because was that when you, after you did Cuckoo's Nest? And yeah. It was after Cuckoo's Nest. Film community is very small in San Francisco. Wow. And I was fresh out of school, and I loved what I was doing. I basically, for a long while, just lived it fantasy i did my shift or two shifts working on the film and then what was great is it really is a music recording studio mm -hmm. and so their recording artists would come in at night and we would clear out the you know the the uh, rooms of all the film gear and the music guys would come in and then record all night so for me this was a this was a great thing to be able to work on film all day and listen to music all night <laughs> wow <laughs> that was really pretty great and so you know I was just one of the younger workers starting out that happened to you know fit the bill that George wanted some sort of what he called resident assistant so that's great and that was in the editorial department right 
Yeah. So now you've also since then worked in in the camera department in as director at worn many hats. Is that right? Yeah. It's it's all part of the same thing. You know, the tools of the trade, and and basically it's storytelling. And so you know you use the different tools to help you tell the story. And George is he's better than anybody I've ever been around in terms of being able to tell a story. He is a he is a really, really talented storyteller. That's amazing. Like, let me ask about that because now in those different disciplines, you find any difference between being an editor versus the director and what your storytelling well, style will be? I'm gonna. Director? I'll tell you. I'll answer that by telling you what George told me because that first day when I was standing there in front of George and I had met him before. I had met him at at a very early screening for Star Wars. I'm sure it made no impression on him, except why would this this guy be complimenting George on THX when you're running Star Wars? But when George offered me the job, I said, you know, George, I, I went to film school, and my dream is to direct my own movies, make movies. And his answer to me was the answer that I give today to other people. And he said that you write a movie three times. You write it when you write it. You rewrite it when you direct it, meaning you're now bringing talent to it, actors, you're bringing props, you're bringing lighting, cameras, all of that, different tools to tell that story. And then you rewrite it a third time in the editing room. I kind of thought for a minute and he said, you know, if you want to direct movies, there's three ways you can go about doing that. And one, he said, was you just go out and find whatever work you can and direct whatever you can and learn by experience. Secondly, he said, you can write and eventually control your own material and ultimately get the opportunity to someday direct. And he said, the third way you learn directing is through editing. And uh, I, yeah, I spent a lot of time with George over the years. And you know, all of my storytelling uh, was learned through editing. And if you look in film history, there's a lot of great film editors that became great film directors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting from like Eisenstein and Robert Wise and all these yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah, David Lean. David Lean. David also. Lean, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So, and but not and, George though. He didn't start out. Ah, uh, well, you know, you'd have to get clarification on this, but you know, George wanted to be an editor. He is an editor. He is a genius editor. Like I said, he can tell a story better than anybody. Maybe not sitting in a room and telling a story that way, but with his gifts, telling a visual story with images, you know, he'd put any of the cavemen and their cave drawings to, uh, to shame. No, he is brilliant. He, I've seen him work with a lot of different projects and a lot of different, Steven Spielberg included. And George just has the gift. And it's my understanding that he only became a director because he couldn't get into the Editor's Guild. Very tight. It's hard. Right? And Can you get into the editor's skill today? Is that still a it's, tough? it's very hard. It's the really? catch-22. It's like you have to have a job in order to get in, but you can't get the job unless you're in the union. It's very, very difficult, and probably more so back then. And, and so, you know, George decided, well, if I direct my own movies, that means I can edit my own movies. And he is the most comfortable in the editing room. And that's why it doesn't surprise me that... He plays such a big part in the whole Clone Wars series mm -hmm. here. Yeah, he's very involved in the editing. It's, he loves it, and it comes natural to him. So, well, let me ask, since we're, along, we're on that subject, uh, the last, the prequel movies that came out, there was a lot of criticism about that they weren't, they didn't live up to the, the fans and all that kind of stuff of what had happened, what he did in the first three, right? The New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and all that kind of stuff. What's your take on, on how his approach was when, when those movies came out? You know, it's a couple of things. One, what's really difficult is to put Star Wars in perspective. And the first Star Wars changed film grammar. 
that vocabulary did not exist before Star Wars came out. And that's why it was so hugely, profoundly, it had a profound effect on a lot of people. We hadn't seen space like that or stories told quite that way. The use of the special effects and the camera work and the sound effects was really terrific. And not only did George story-wise base it on certain mythology, but the whole idea of Star Wars was that he created characters and situations that made great impressions. Darth Vader, R2-D2, C-3PO, Luke Skywalker, Obi-Wan, Kenobi, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Chewbacca. You know, you go through the list. Well, Iconic figures. Well, they are. And so uh, one of the difficulties with the first three Star Wars was he created great stories, great characters, great personalities, And, you know, it's one of the things George does better than anybody is is he introduces characters better than anybody. And you immediately know who those characters, just look at the opening of American Graffiti, you know, exactly who those characters are within seconds of seeing them on screen. And it's what Walt Disney said, that you need three things to tell a successful story, personality, personality, and personality. And see, that's the thing that... Those first three Star Wars had all the kinds of personality and story, and, and we hadn't seen this kind of visual language before. The second three, the so-called prequels, they had a more advanced technology. But you were in the same universe telling the same story, but guess what? You didn't necessarily have R2 and Luke and Vader, and you know the list goes on and on. And, and those are the characters that that we all came to love and want to be part of with the first three Star Wars. So you go back in time and you don't have those characters anymore. It's really not the same experience. But technologically speaking, the, the prequels are far advanced over you know the first three. And storyboards was a big part of that. You know, Star Wars was done traditional storyboards. Just boards. And boards are difficult. They're, vis- they're difficult for, you know, yes, it's a still image of moment in time and usually drawn in a very dramatic fashion. And quite often you can never even get a real camera in the position that this wonderful artist has drawn for you. And so Star Wars was to help everybody visualize because we all have different degrees of you know, sort of visual acumen. It's like, you know, we don't show the show the picture and you, everybody gets it. Try and describe it, and especially if it doesn't even exist, very difficult to do. So Star Wars used traditional storyboards. By the time we got to Empire, Empire, we created what we called animatics. And it was simply drawn storyboards put together like, flip book so you'd have kind of in-betweens and so they were animatics that you'd film them and you'd cut it in and so transfer it to film and so you'd have these still images but it would show a progression of a shot or action and then by the time we got to Jedi we video was around and accessible and there were enough little characters from Star Wars and the model shop. And the first thing we did was we did the speeder bike chase on video and we called them, we called them vidiots. 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 Uh, Why, where where did that name come from? Well, it was sort of, at that time, video was a a lesser term than film. And (laughs) we, we just made little video shots, uh, visual storyboards, of each of these shots. We did have traditional ink storyboard, but we then shot with a little camera and a little forest set and, you know, whatever the set was. And then we were able to transfer to film and and cut it in and play with it and put sound effects in. And actually the very first scene, the the speeder bike chase for Jedi was completed in video form just prior to commencement of principal photography. 
it was the first scene put together frame for frame. And, and so what was great about that is then, A, you can cut it into your movie and people see it for what it is and understand the story. But B, you can give that to the visual effects department and they can then go in and match those shots. And they can match them frame to frame. And it always has amazed me in all the pictures I've worked on that George had a rule, 16 frames handle at the head of a shot, 16 frames at the end. Now, film runs at 24 frames a second. That's less than a second. He knew the length of his shot. That's a very rare talent. Most people... And he was accurate? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I think if you... You know, all the effect shots, uh, I think we did a calculation at one time in Jedi, which there was 1,500, 1,600 effect shots, and I think the average length would have been somewhere around 32 frames. No, I've never seen anybody be able to do that, where he's just cutting to different color of film leader, you know, changed from blue to red to yellow to white and or grease pencil marks on it, and he, he has this sense of timing and what the action should be. And I've never seen anybody come close to matching that. Wow, great. So as a director, you worked on, I mean, the list goes on and on, many things, Twin Peaks, recently JAG, right, the, the TV series? yeah. Can you talk a little bit about staging and how you handle that with the actors? Do the actors come first or... Do you conceptualize what you want beforehand? Well, you do conceptualize. I think you have to. And again, I mean, I've been blessed and fortunate to have worked with some really talented filmmakers. And my directorial style and process comes from those guys. And I know the importance of having a shot list, some idea of, you know, here's what editing helps you. When you're editing a scene, you have to A, know what is this scene about, who is it about, and what is the moment in this scene? Because every scene has a moment. And honestly, if that scene is not advancing the story, it probably isn't going to be in the movie anyway. So once you learn how to establish that, then you you do the same with reading a script or writing a script. What is this story about? So my approach is, that, that I try to visualize as best I can what the scene is about and understand and study. What is the scene about? What is the moment? You know, what is it really about? And it's usually some underlying meaning that's not necessarily apparent. Are you talking about the emotion or just the action? That goes All on? of it. The action is pretty literal, but, you know, what's driving it? What's, where's the character? What's the state of mind? What's, you know... So, you know, you're looking at all of that, and and so that tells you, you know, gee, is the character sitting down, standing up, or lying down, or hanging upside down from the ceiling? You know, what's the state of mind? What are you trying to communicate? What is the story you're telling? And the value I find in that is that, A, you can show up in the morning with a game plan, a blueprint, And by the way, the script is nothing more than a blueprint to making the movie because it's going to go through this huge transformation from words on a page to actors speaking those words and moving and cameras capturing the image to an editor sitting there and arranging and rearranging saying, I want to see this, I don't want to see this. And so again, that rewriting three three different times. But you show up in the morning and it's chaotic a lot of questions, filmmaking is problem solving, and it does help tremendously to have a shot list. It don't doesn't mean you have to follow that shot list. You can vary from that. And oftentimes, you know, you'll have a shot list and with you and your cameraman, you'll figure out how to maybe make two shots into one or three shots into one or, you know, but basically you... And, and, and then it, it, given the time, feature film time frame is much different than television. And so the story, I have the first opportunity I got to do my first professional directing was, was the first episode of Twin Peaks. And I'd cut for David Lynch. And so I, I asked David, I said, 
you know, I just wanted to know what what's sort of the process. You know, what can I expect? You know, when I show up in the morning, and what do you do? And so David's thing was, here's what you do: you show up, you get your actors, you go in the set, and you just sort of start walking and talking and breaking down the scene. And when you get to a certain point where you kind of have something roughed out, then bring your DP in. And you go through it again, refine it a little bit further and get some suggestions, some input, and then bring your keys in and you start now incorporating lighting designs and so forth into it. And you refine it yet a little bit further. Then you turn the set over to the crew and go with your actors and and go and then, you know, start rehearsing the scene. Then a DP will let you know when the set is ready and you come back. So I showed up day one on Twin Peaks and I proceeded to tell the guys this is how we were going to do it. And I just looked around the room. These, they, their mouths were open, their eyeballs were popping out. And if they couldn't believe I was actually serious about this is going to be our process. Television is a much different thing. Well, why were they so confused? Because of well, the schedule? Was... Because you only have so many so many minutes in a day and and what i found is the way television works you show up and you you walk in and everybody's there cast and crew okay great here's what we're doing guys you grab your actors say you're coming through the door and you're over here and you're over there and the camera's over here someplace and okay now here's what we're going to do we're going to come through like this we're going to do an over here and a wide shot there and go over and over and go close and close, and then he's going to move over to here. And Okay, you got that? And everybody's sort of nodding. They don't, but they're nodding their head. And, <laughs> and, then, and it go, literally, it, it goes that fast. And so then, then you kind of do a rehearsal and you let your actors, okay, they kind of got the idea, where am I moving and what's happening here? Now they're going to make variations on that. And, and then your DP is standing there, and he's trying to figure out, you know, I only have like 20 minutes to light the scene, so I, I, I can't turn around. Once I set my lights, I, we're set in one direction. You know, that's a different world than film where you've got more time. And television, you want to get your first shot off in the day as, on anything as quick as you can. But sometimes on, on films, you'll rehearse for the major part of a day. Well, I mean, that must be a great training ground, the fact that you have these time limitations. You have to get things... I mean, you make story decisions really quickly, I imagine, right? Not so much story decisions, because that's that, to me, is a lot of homework. That's your, you know... <clears throat> I try to stay at least a day ahead in in what I have prepped. I go into it, and I always want to get through the whole script prior to first day of shooting and have my my shot lists and diagrams, my chicken scratches, you, you never do. It, it just, it changes, you know, you locations come and go and, you know, you can't shoot there for this reason or that. And you're constantly adapting and changing, but yes, TV is a tremendous training ground. And as I may say that this series, the clone wars is even a better training. Is that right? oh, in, in what sense? <laughs> Because it, it, it enables you as the storyteller to have all these tools at your disposal. And yes, the technology, the way the tools work could be simpler, and someday they, it will be simpler. It's just like the first computers. You know, you had to have some sort of PhD to, <laughs> right. to figure it out, you know. But now, you know, you want it as simple as just push the button and go. And, and it will happen. But what it lets you do, more so than at any time in the history of film, this, this form of pre allows an artist to sit down and bring in all the characters, all the props, in an environment that you are going to play in, and start moving them around. And you, you're actually putting them in time and space, where if I were doing this for anything other than, than, say, the Clone Wars series, I'm just drawing two-dimensional on a piece of paper. And, you know, I don't require sophisticated storyboards. You know, stick figures work well enough for me. And with, with this previs, you actually get to get in there 
and you are incorporating every single element of storytelling in this previous. You've got to be thinking, I like to rely on my crew and my cast to bring something to, to the project. This is, you know, they're just, they don't, they, they, their feet don't move, their mouths don't move. It's just a, this block of wood. And so you say, gee, well, maybe the hands would be like this. Yeah, that, that, that suggests that kind of pose. And, and then you're doing this and you're doing that, and suddenly your, your blocks of wood are coming to life. You don't need any dialogue because it's all visual. We're working in a visual medium. That's the thing about it, which is great. And so you get to see your characters in time and space, and then you know you can record the dialogue and put it in there. And it's, it is exactly like being on a set where you go from the house lights are on, the work lights are on, and it kind of looks funky, and your actors are half in dress, half not, half with makeup, half not. And then there's this time where you turn the set over to the camera department, the lighting department, and the actors rush off, and they get made up and dressed up. And, and then, okay, they're coming. And, and then you walk in, and wow, the set is lit, and it's a whole different world. It's a whole other environment. And now there's real actors, and you know there's cameras. And you know it's a very exciting moment. And I find myself in this previs experiencing that same moment when you've blocked something out and suddenly you say my goodness this didn't exist two hours ago and suddenly I'm watching a scene and people are moving and carrying on and interacting and it's purely magic is this the future of filmmaking well I think it is a very important tool in the future of filmmaking yes this technology it will do what the video camera did to the normal, as Francis said once in the Academy Awards, you know, with this little video camera, any 10-year-old can make a movie. And it's become so. And this tool, when it is available and made simple enough, it is the same kind of shift that anybody can sit down and make a movie now. It, it becomes that simple. You don't necessarily have to go outside and shoot and come back and edit. And, you know, the filmmaking process is a very long, tedious process. It takes a long time to realize shots and the whole movie coming together. What the previs does, yes, it's rough. It's extremely rough. But in very short order, you get to see your story and the action you're committing to. And the wonderful thing is, the best thing about previs is that it changes the process of filmmaking. Filmmaking is always pre-production, then production where you shoot it, and then you're in post-production. And that means if you didn't think of it in pre-production, you probably don't have it in production. And if you didn't shoot it in production, you certainly don't have it in post-production. Previs enables you to cross over in those three disciplines several times over. So you're thinking about it, you're shooting, you say, oh my goodness, we really should have another car or something, you know, a prop or what if this, and that's no problem. You know, just make a note, you'll go get it. And, and now you're putting it in a timeline and editing and seeing the action and the pace and, and you're going back and you're adding things and you're going back and shooting. No, I should have shot it this way. Maybe I'll just change the camera here. And pretty soon, you know, there you are. In the real world, you never get that opportunity. It's just, it's split up. That's why previs is great. It lets you see as close as you can to the final product in a very rough state. Just a few more questions. You worked on Twin Peaks, and you said you mentioned you work with David Lynch, Blue Velvet. Can you talk a little bit about that type of storytelling and the way that those movies unfolded? You were in the editorial department on Blue Velvet, is that right? Yeah, I, I was the editor on Blue Velvet. It's storytelling. It is a different kind of story. I know when I didn't know David, I knew of his work. He asked me to cut Blue Velvet, and I got the. he gave me the script, and I read it, and, you know, I really was didn't know what to think about it, you know. Right. It's a very complicated and deep 
story to it certainly cipher. it yeah, certainly was it. different than anything i had worked on but and in fact i told david i he said well what do you think and i said well you know i was very moved by this story i don't you know i think the way i explained it was it's not really my cup of tea you know david i'm i'm more sort of a disney kind of story guy you know happy trails to you sort of thing and you know with the star wars and that sort of thing it's those are the similar stories and it took weeks and a couple of months before i was convinced that i actually could do a story like that what i came to find is that you know we probably all have certain kinds of stories that we're better capable of telling than others but in the end it's all storytelling what is your character Who's the character? You know, that expression of story is, uh, you know, how, how do you break down a story? Well, who's your main character? What does he want? And what's preventing him from getting it? It's really that simple. It, so you can translate that across any genre or spectrum of story. And it always comes down to that. And, of course, what the editor and Marsha Lucas taught me this long ago you know, she made a statement one day. She said, you know, editing is really very simple. You only ever have to ask yourself one question. Where do I want to be now? And that sounded kind of simple at the time. It's extremely difficult because as an editor, you are deciding where is the audience at every given moment. So you really do begin to learn story and the other tools of storytelling, the camera angles, where where do you want to be now? What do I want to see? What's important and what's not important? Because that's filmmaking. Filmmaking is putting rectangles around images and you're only selecting what's inside and you're rejecting everything else, which is the vast majority. So it's real selective focus. In any facet of storytelling, it, in any kind of story, it all comes down to you know, who's your main character and what are the problems associated with that character? Awesome. So, so simple, but it, I mean, I mean, it's so difficult. Well, it's very hard because when you have stories running in parallel, like American Graffiti, four or five stories, and even when you don't, any climax in the story, well, how can you be in four or five places at the same time? And if you are running parallel, you want those climaxes all at the same time. And so you have to decide. It's very, very difficult. There's a real art to it. So you're working, you, you've worked on many big Hollywood productions. I'm assuming that, well, it's much different from the world that I know, for example. I'm just assuming that you have an agent, mm -hmm. right? right? And so how does it work when you're at that kind of level? Is it easier to find work? Is it harder? Is it more just the same thing, just at a different level of, you know, do you, you meet people, like you're saying, the film industry is small? Or? Yes, it is a very small fraternity worldwide. And anybody who even has the opportunity to make a movie deserves a major award because it is really difficult to do. I don't mean just the work itself. It's what goes into being fortunate enough, lucky enough to actually get a job and work in any capacity in film there's just so little work. And the industry is changing, and it has changed during the course of my career. You know, life is about contacts. Life is about kind of who you know and how these opportunities come along. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And you need a, a little of, of both to be successful in, in, in life and especially in, in the film business. Dwayne Denham, thank you so much. Those insights are incredible. You're welcome. I mean, it's inspiration for guys like us who, who want to aspire to do the kinds of things that you've done and continue to do. So I hope you keep it up and, and move the industry forward into new heights. Thank you. Thank you very much.